Chris and welcome to this week's episode of the Piping People podcast and uh, today represents a very special day for me because I'm joined by uh, Mariana Lisboa. Mariana, thank you very much for being here with us today. Um, thank you for having been, me. The reason it's a very happy day for me is because we've been uh, talking about getting together and collaborating on an episode for probably about nine months <laughs> so it's nice <laughs> for it to finally finally our diaries align and uh, you know we, we get there um Absolutely. so, <laughs> so mariana for, for those people um that have yet to have the pleasure of making your acquaintance you are the um machine learning operations manager for chatter mill and uh we have had a few uh, chats and a few conversations and I guess to, to frame the conversation today in terms of the topics that we were, we were going to cover, um, we talked about how you know, machine learning, data, data science is an area that now is, is really becoming quite front and centre for a lot of businesses and actually attracting a lot of people from all different walks of life, you know, not necessarily people purely from a technical background or a kind of a STEM background, but actually people maybe that come from more of a business um or product kind of background as well um so um so yeah i guess we'll sort of pull on that thread a little bit more and, and talk through uh that in a bit more detail but i suppose to put a bit of context in terms of your situation do you maybe want to give us a bit of an overview of your your background uh you know your kind of career to date and uh and how you arrived in the in the role that you're in with with um chatter mill at the moment yeah absolutely um so uh, as you said um my name is Mariana. Uh, I come from Portugal, which is where I'm in right now due to the pandemic. So sunny Portugal, I thought, why not uh, take on and, and try and make the most out of this, these circumstances. Um, but um, originally from here, I moved to London in 2012. So I think, yeah, I was 20 years old um, and I went uh, to London to study. Uh, I did my undergrad um, in international business. Um, and then following on the same path, I also ended up taking a master's uh, in the same in international business. Very keen, uh, you see a pattern there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah um, so that's my academic uh, background. Um, I then, I worked throughout uni as well, like just, you know, making, um, making some money aside to pay rent and, and, and pay for, for living costs. Um, and then soon after finishing my master's, I joined Chattimil. Um So this was in 2019, March 2019. Um, I joined as a uh, data, data operations associate. Um, so for a bit of context, what, what Chattermill does is we analyze uh, customer feedback data um, in terms of sentiments um, and we use AI to help us processing um, <clears throat> sorry, that data in, in real time and, and obviously in an accurate way uh, for our clients. Um, and in, in my team, what I was hired for uh, mainly uh, back then was to create uh, the team structure. So to, to capture like in the big bulk of data that we were sent, fully unstructured, uh, try and make a design like a taxonomy and, 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 and create a structure of all the key points that were coming up um, quite significantly in, in their customer feedback. Um, and then we start training an algorithm, um, ensuring that um, it's as accurate as it can be. Uh, and we assign the sentiment and, and, and once we provide that to the clients, um, it will help this, them pull out insights on, on what areas of the business they're doing well, what areas can they improve in, um, and really, really put their customers at the forefront of, of their um, internally. Um, so yeah, that's where I started. Um, then really started getting into, into the machine learning side. So when I started, I basically would overview the quality of the initial, um, the initial samples, and then kind of pass it on to data science, who would take, um, which would take it from there. Um, at the moment, the team is, is already now responsible for the full training, uh, reiterations uh, needed in order to get uh, our algorithms to a deployable state. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot of learning there, uh, but it's been, been super exciting. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. That's, that's really interesting insight. And um, yeah, I guess sentiment analysis, you know, kind of NLP, uh, it's a really exciting area of, of AI, isn't it? And I think it... Um, yeah. It is so 
uh, interesting because businesses really can sort of extract a lot of direct value from it, you know, in terms of actually really understanding what's going on with their, with their customers. Um, and like you said, be able to make some really kind of informed decisions based on the insights that that kind of pulls up. So, yeah, I think it's a very interesting area of, um, of AI and a very relevant application for, for machine learning. So, uh, so brilliant. So your, your kind of background then, I guess it sort of very much plays into that category we're talking about, about somebody who hasn't necessarily overtly come from a, a, a technical background, a coding background. Um, how have you, yeah, you know, just listening and speaking to you there clearly, you know, <laughs> know what you're talking about you're very informed clearly very good at what you do so how have you found that um journey you know of going into a, a tech and kind of data focused business interfacing with you know very sort of technical um data scientists uh, but not necessarily having come from a purely technical background yourself uh yeah it, i mean it's been super exciting but definitely came with its challenges um i can tell you like a quick story i remember I joined the company. I had um, a two, three week trainings uh, with the girl that I that I was replacing essentially. Uh, and I remember my first week fully alone, um, having a conversation with two two data scientists uh, who had different opinions on how to go about uh, an issue that we were facing. Uh, and this was my first week alone. And then I, I'm just there like sitting and looking at them, like talking about like jargon that I, it didn't really mean much to me. And then they kind of both turned their heads to me, like looking at me, like waiting. So what approach should we take? Like, what do you think we should take? Um, and I remember like that was a very daunting uh, moment for me. Um, but I mean, I guess like one of, one of the cons of, not having this kind of experience is you're kind of at the mercy per se of like how the other person um perceives your, your knowledge has to be like in 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 the matter so hmm. you know like a lot of times you're talking to very technical people and they might feel they might think that um naturally like you know you know a lot about like, the science or you know a lot about the technical um the technical side um especially in the beginning um, so I guess like what the approach that I took uh, in, in the initial time at Chattermill um, and my advice would for people that might be feeling a bit out of depth uh, there is, you know, to be humble, like be honest, um, level with them. We're all a team. We're all in this together. Uh, ask as many questions as you can um, mm. and really don't be afraid to say, like, I'm not fully sure I understand what you, what you, what you mean. Um, and then I think I was lucky enough, and I think in general you, you will be too. Um, my team was super supportive. So these two particular guys um, are like I still call them like my mentors in a jokey way, but like they really, really have taught me pretty much everything I know um, about machine learning. Um, so it's been it's been incredible working with them. So they've been super supportive, and you know you when you have people that are able to like kind of come down to your level and fully understand like so when can we be technical like to what point um really helps and you know, gradually you start picking it up and and now we can have like conversations of whole days about machine learning and you know yeah. really be on the same page brilliant perfect that's great advice you know um like i said be humble don't be afraid to ask the question i think in you know that's very applicable advice i guess to lots of areas of business isn't it and you know not necessarily just machine learning and, and sort of technical non-technical people but you know why should we why, why why is there this level of perceived fear of you know admitting we don't know something and you know wanting to learn something surely all people in all businesses should be wanting to learn more about their their colleagues what they're doing you know different different sort of areas and i think the businesses that i see that are you know really thriving and have the right culture you know there isn't that kind of um perception of of fear or or being chastised for not knowing something it's very much an openness you know to go well look, i don't know that but how can we work it out together and um, and, and I suppose really the virtue of, of a team, you know, when you talk about a, a team and what, what the strengths are of a team, having a diverse team of people is that everybody brings something different to the table. So, you know, there's always this argument yeah. about, do you really want 
a cookie cutter, you know, type blueprint person where everyone has exactly the same skills or actually our, our team is stronger when they are more diverse and people bringing different strengths and, you know, experiences to the table. Um, so I guess with that in mind, you know, you spoke a little bit there about the, you know, the potential pitfalls or the potential cons that you, the way you might feel if you, you didn't necessarily come from a technical background going into that environment. But what do you see as the, as the positives, you know, and the kind of pros of, of being somebody like yourself, um, you know, very business savvy, understanding things a lot more from the business perspective, going into a, a technical team, you know, what, what are the advantages of that? I mean, there's, there's definitely advantages. I think like, if I think about it, potentially more advantages than, than cons, like if, again, if, if you're working in that inclusive team and supportive, um, then there, there are a few advantages. I think coming from a business background, uh, you come with like that strategic mindset and commercial mindset. So like, you are sensitive to that side as well, um, which is particularly good, like, because in machine learning operations, we very much work as a bridge between data science and the commercial teams. Um, so, which is an, another advantage for it would be like the communication skills and, and to be able to, to be that bridge efficiently and, you know, by developing the knowledge with the data science guys, um, we're then able to translate that into what that actually means uh, close to the commercial teams and mm. uh, kind of like filter out all the jargon, put it like in, in, in very concise points of actions or conclusions that, that we took, uh, that we took from, from what is able to be done from from the technical side and and what can we um and how can that play with what the clients need um so really like being that bridge um and the ability of communicating and, and being cre creative um understanding like both sides limitations on on the technology but need to fulfill something on the commercial side and kind of like so being the bridge and, and putting that jigsaw puzzle like pieces together and um, with what's possible and what we need um yeah. so definitely definitely something that i learned um you know like in, in the management degree is it's all about flexibility and about and about like no person or no client is going to be unique they all kind of like need different solutions uh so having that like ability to to maneuver and find like um flexible and, and creative solutions yeah absolutely i mean you you, you think you're hitting it on the head there when you, you obviously described it being the conduit between the the two teams you know the, the key there really is, is i suppose communication isn't it and you, you're obviously playing such an important role you know some people that are able to be that conduit between technical non-technical stakeholders within the business you know that role historically I think hasn't always necessarily been there and businesses haven't necessarily sort of um, always felt the need to have that person in situ. You know, it's always, it was used to be in my opinion, kind of a bit of an us and them with a lot of sort of technical people, you know, they've seen very much as a, a separate silo to the business. Oh, they're the techie guys, they're the IT guys, they just do their own thing, you know, and we're, we're, we're running the business over here. Whereas now technology, you know, and as I suppose we've all sort of moved towards more of a digital era, you know, technology it is it is the driving force in so many businesses and i guess especially within the technology you know focused business such as chattanoe that the the ability to really be able to have slick communication processes and and have both sides of the fence felt like they're being understood and being able to communicate with each other effectively that's that's so valuable isn't it and i guess just so so important for a business to have somebody like you that can that can effectively do that Absolutely, I think like it's it's more and more important that um, we develop like this knowledge for 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 the technical side, but the soft skills as well to to be able to uh, to come together with a strategy, you know, as a business um, that works uh, for everyone. Um, so yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah, cool. Um, now you've kind of got more involved in the world of data and machine learning and AI. I guess you know, but at the early stages maybe it was a little bit of a gamble to understand is this something you'd be really interested in longer term you know obviously speaking to you and knowing you a bit better now and, and just hearing you talk about it clearly is something you're genuinely interested in and kind of passionate about um but what what are you what are you kind of most excited about now i guess in the world of of data is there anything that's kind of really uh you know sort of tickled fancy and, and sort of floats your boat about where uh, where we are with ai and machine learning now 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, like, I think we saw earlier in 2020, like, all over the media, like, how data is now the most valuable commodity, um, compared, and, and it overtook uh, the place for, for oil. So it's definitely, like, something super exciting to, to, to be part of and, and to work so closely with. Um, I think... Like with great power comes great responsibility. So there's definitely, definitely some some responsibility there to apply uh, our access um, to such a, a powerful resource um, in a correct way. But I think there's a lot of of good that can can come out um, using data. And I think it's part of why I love uh, Chatter Mill so much is is to is because our mission is to help um, our clients serve. Their, their customers like um, and keep them at the very core of their decision making. Um, you know, essentially what that means for us as individuals is that we're going to get what we want and what we expect from the services that we use on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, I'd say there's, I'd say like what I'm most excited about is those positive sides of it and, and how personalized and, and improved our experiences can be as individuals. Um, with all the services and products that that um, that we use on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's really interesting, isn't it? When you talk about you know data, how the the connotations that exist around that word in society now, because I suppose data historically has been this quite, you know, maybe seen as quite cold, sterile, maybe boring subject in in times gone by to kind of where we are today, where, like you say, it is such a valuable commodity now, is recognized as having such, you know, great impact on, on a business being able to really fully understand their data. I mean, it is a very, I always say it's very emotive, very emotionally charged word now, where two people can look at the word and think, you know, very, very different things. Some people, like say, see it as a real force for good. Uh, some people see it as a real opportunity. Other people hear the word data and, you know, it conjures up yeah, connotations yeah. of, you know, super villains and uh, people being evil with <laughs> data and all that kind of thing. So, and I suppose the media, I guess, has a lot to answer for with that. But, you know, we have seen some real kind of yeah. real world applications or real world situations where data has been misused, you know, and that kind of has brought about, um, you know, data misuse into the public domain as a, as a potentially quite big, uh, you know, factor for people to consider and a, and a big negative of data as well. Um, but I also agree with you, you know, there are, there are so many, upsides of how data can be used if we get it right you know if businesses have the right ethics and and mm -hmm. you know the right approach um but uh yeah i, I believe that the, that the positives will far outweigh the negatives uh so uh, so fingers crossed that that happens absolutely yeah i'd rather be the optimistic one uh, uh on, on the optimistic side of of you know the, the world of data Absolutely. You and me both. We'll be, we'll be flying the flag. <laughs> um, cool. So, yeah, the, I mean, really, really interesting. And, you know, uh, that's um, some great perspective shared there around your, your background. And, and the other thing I think we actually started talking about in the first instance when we first uh, first started chatting was uh, True North. As you know, obviously, we're big advocates of the, the women in tech movement. Um, and, you know, we do help, thankfully, a lot of uh, a lot of ladies and, and women with their careers um, moving forward in tech. Um, we we spoke about obviously being a kind of senior manager, female senior leader within the business. Um, you know what your experiences have been. Um, you know and and, and good, bad, or indifferent. Um, you know within that. So I quite like to just sort of cover that in a little bit of detail, if you if you wouldn't be uh, if you have to be keen. And uh, yeah, how do you feel the, the the landscape is looking at the moment for for women in technology from your your personal experience as a as a leader within tech um yeah i mean it's it's a very interesting uh, relevant uh, subject and and there's definitely a lot of uh, a lot to say there i think from my personal experience um at chatmo we do have a uh, quite a balanced i'd say potentially still a bit more men than women but um we do have quite a balanced uh, gender ratio um internally which which is great to see. So I think not just a chat to mill, it's it's something that we're making progress in and in trying to like fill that gap uh, between number of men versus number of women working in, in in the industry. I think I can give you an example. 
like not only see you know women working like in, in junior roles in in in, uh, in in this industry but you also start seeing them in higher up positions in and sometimes leading their own like tech companies which is is really great to see and um, progress being done there i think uh, as an example last year i attended the web summit in, in lisbon um and there was honestly quite a balanced ratio in in terms of women and men in the panel so it was great to see like for such a big tech event and and, and like very recognized event it, it was really good to see representation there um so I, I do think although there's still um a gap to address um we are seeing some progress also if you if you look at how much uh, companies are trying to focus on on diversity inclusion um and creating better not just more opportunities but better opportunities for women to to start up in tech and and um and succeed and give them the opportunities to also like go up the ladder um yeah i think it's also a huge point and and apparently like according to a lot of research pays off as well for for the businesses in terms of organizational and, and even financial performance mm. um so i think we are on the right track um yeah. right now um but there's there's still some work to be done yeah yeah totally agree totally agree you know it just it feels like i am uh you know being in the market day in day out um obviously i do speak to a lot of different people and i believe like say there is still a gap there but one thing i'm really quite you know pleased by over my 13 years experience in in the industry now is compared to when i sort of first started 2007 2008 to where we are today I'm seeing a lot more uh, senior appointments, you know, a lot, lot more female C, uh, CEO, um, you know, CTO appointments as well in the market, which is really great and really kind of encouraging to see. And um, I think it, it is a trend that, interestingly, I mean, I started out my life uh, recruiting the software engineering market and you know, probably 12, 13 years ago in software engineering, it was a very, very, you know, a very high imbalance, you know, probably talking like, Five percent, uh, I'd say, females within the within the world of software engineering at that time, uh, and thankfully we've sort of seen a, a slow progression towards where we are today, where it is a lot more equally um, balanced and, and thankfully a lot more kind of open and diverse. Um, what I'm finding, actually, what I'm seeing is a, a trend, even more so, I think, within the the world of data science as well. Um, I'm sort of seeing that as more of a Thankfully, more of a diverse uh, vertical, more uh, ladies interested in getting involved within um, the world of data. And yeah, I'm not casting dispersions at all here, not, not being sexist, you know, talking about men and women and the differences between the two. But obviously, one of the, 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 the studies that um, is quite, quite famous is about, you know, women historically have higher levels of empathy than men and actually that works really well in sort of leadership and management positions because you know they're, they're looking at it from a point of view of the people they're leading often versus where you know, men potentially can be looking at it from what this is my my agenda this is what i want to do um and i think i wonder whether that's actually something that's, that sort of lends itself really well to the world of data and data science and and empathy and understanding of you know the business problem uh, versus where historically, and again, not casting dispersions here, but you know, in the past, software engineers have been sort of uh, potentially guilty or, or sort of seen in the eyes of the business of just wanting to play with the latest technology, just wanting to to focus u using the latest, you know, um, cool hot technology because it's what they want to work on, versus actually understanding why are we doing this? You know, what's what's the what's the business purpose and that kind of thing. And and I think that's um yeah possibly a trend I can see as as to why women are you know, thankfully getting a lot of recognition and, and sort of really starting to make a real uh, rise through the ranks in the world of data science. Uh, you know, so for that reason. So that's just something I've kind of I think personally seen over the course of the last couple of years and, and I think we're sort of shifting in the right direction. And I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a hundred percent agreed. And, and again, like it's it's great to to see like a movement um, happening and progress being being made. I think um, platforms such as True North as well are really really help. Um, you know, like advocating for for this cause of of uh, filling in that gender gap um, 
in in this industry and as well as like giving us women who are already in tech like the opportunity to to come out and speak about their experience and 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 you know like hopefully they're, they're having good uh, experiences as I am and being really advocates you know encouraging and, and hopefully inspiring other women who may be thinking about um, making that move uh, to actually go for it um, but yeah so a hundred percent a hundred percent agree. cool good yeah I and mean, I suppose on that note actually what do you think Bearing in mind we both agree there's there is a movement in a positive direction, thankfully now, uh, that feels to be happening in the market. Um, what do you think could still be some of the main reasons, you know, that stopping more women getting into technology that exists today? Have you got any insight into that? Um yeah, I think like like you said, like I'm not trying to generalize and but you know, like um like you said about the empathy, I think women also might potentially value like the relationship building, um, like relationship and forming these, uh, you know, like in their social lives as well as in their workplace. And so I, I really think that, you know, the building of relationships thrives in an environment that's inclusive and, and diverse. Um, and when, if you have that as a motivation and, and a big factor for you that you want to be able to, to build these relationships and friendships like in, in your place of at work, which is where we spend the majority of our lives really. So why wouldn't you want to make friends there? And I think if you don't see, if you look at like so many companies that are still very male um, oriented, like very formed of, of, of um, men still, you might not see that diversity there and, and therefore like you tend to, to to kind of like step back a bit like can I really you know go into a company like even if it's a small company of like 20 men and potentially two women and is this somewhere that I'd feel like comfortable and 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 part of of the team uh, fully so by not having um fully addressed and, and filled this this gap I think it's it's still maybe playing a, a role um, on in stopping in stopping women to to uh, go for for that tech role um, I think also and it, I it might be a bit like odd and stretch but I think education plays actually a, um, a big role on this as well so I think you know, when, when I went to, at least until I went to, to university, like uh, tech, tech courses were very, very um, focused on men. Like the majority of, 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 of people that attended like tech, uh, tech, tech courses were, were boys. And as, as a 17, 18 year old girl or boy, I think when you're looking at what degree you're going to pursue, you're not just looking at that or uh, that specific subject subject and, and degree mm. but you're also looking at the experience that you're going to get from uni i think you know you're potentially moving out of your parents you want to meet new people new different backgrounds and and um nationalities cultures like you just want to like go out there and explore the world and i think potentially can be a bit off-putting if um you know you see that um the course that you're going to go for like above 90 percent it's going to be men you might not see like that diversity there that's going to give you like uh the that life awakening experience that that you expect from uni yeah that's a really good point actually and i totally agree i think that um often we're, we're too quick to blame companies as they are today you know as to the reasons why do you not hire more women and all that kind of thing and i'm sure we'll get onto that in a minute about you know what what can companies do potentially to address the balance a bit more but i do think the uh, the problem lies inherently a lot earlier on in, in life and i do think yeah sort of systemic um values that exist within schools and uh, both from possibly students and what they choose and, and why but also you know from from teachers as well in terms of you know guiding people down certain paths um i do still think there's a lot of questions to be answered there to get that balance mm -hmm. totally on the right level so we start to see those um those numbers reflecting in the workplace uh, further down the line 
And I guess that's probably a, yeah. a, a bigger separate conversation around education. But I totally agree with you. I don't think it's a purely kind of isolated world of work thing. I think a lot of it is mm -hmm. more about, you know, how I'm people have grown and developed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I do think, though, like we like we are starting to see like coding and other technical skills to be developed from a younger age in school. So it's definitely something very interesting to see, like the impact that that may have in in um bringing more women into the industry as well um yeah. it's definitely like an exciting and i'm very looking forward to seeing you, like what the impact is yes yeah absolutely totally agree um and um i suppose just to go back to the point we mentioned a minute ago there about you know chatter mill being a diverse business has a nice balance at the moment between men and women what in your opinion could companies be doing more of at the moment do you think let's say that they're aware maybe there is a gender imbalance or a or another kind of diversity imbalance that exists within the business and they're looking to kind of even that up for the reasons we mentioned earlier about you know more diverse teams um being stronger um what do you think companies could be doing more of in your opinion to to kind of address that balance and uh and even things out um yeah i think a couple of points there um so I think it's not, I think diversity is a very, very crucial um, aspect to, to businesses, but as well and potentially more important is the inclusivity, like the, the inclusion um, of, of, you know, the team. Um, so I think while, while you may be seen as a diverse company, um, you might not be fully uh, inclusive of the people that work for you and in, in your company. Um, I think, Diversity is all about, you know, creating like this team uh, with different backgrounds, different cultures, rigid, uh, religious beliefs, uh, sexual orientation, etc. I think you can prove that very easily with um, with metrics. Say, so, yeah, we have like, you know, 40% women in our company and so many people from, from different ethnicities and nationalities. But while you may be proving that, you may not be um very inclusive of you know this this diversity that you see uh in the company so i think it's even more important um to to focus on that inclusion and uh, you know picking on like that all of those different people with different backgrounds uh come together and feel safe to to be themselves to voice their opinion and and still be treated the same have the same opportunities um i think fortunately at chatterville i do feel that i feel um, included in the team, I feel uh, supported and, and empowered to to constantly grow. Uh, like especially my manager, he's incredible, um, constantly challenging us, and and I see that happening in um, in the wider team in the business as well. Yeah. So I think definitely focus on on inclusion uh, would be um, would be my my main point. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add something there. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. I think, you know, um, it's, it's an excellent point about the difference between diversity and inclusion. You know, diversity, like you said, that is something in theory that could be proven by an HR department on a spreadsheet. You know, we're a diverse company because of X, Y, Z, but inclusion is it's a lot more fundamental in the business. You know, I think diversity is, some, you know, probably statistical inclusion is cultural, you know, and, and I think it it's all about the culture within the business. Um, and personally, I feel a lot of that is it comes from the top down. Yeah, it's uh, I know obviously lots of businesses will create their own micro cultures and you'll have sort of different cultures and different teams, different divisions, which is, is, you know, it's bound to happen. It's pretty organic. But generally speaking, the, the, the kind of inherent culture of a business is fed from the, the, the real the kind of leaders, the management. And it's really interesting that you mentioned that there when you're talking about inclusion. You mentioned your manager and it's how you feel included in the business. Um, so I do think leaders have a lot to be accountable for when it comes to, you know, it's diversity isn't sort of a buzzword that you put on your website and go, we're a diverse business. It's actually yeah. sitting down and probably having some quite frankly, uncomfortable conversations for a lot of leaders that have never been in this situation before and maybe want to try and bury their head in the sand and don't really want to address it, but they kind of want to be seen to be doing the right thing. You know, it's, uh, can't just pay lip service to it it's something that's got to be some inherent changes that that need to happen within a culture of a business to actually you know be be a fully inclusive business and i think as as leaders you kind of have to hold your hands up to, to having those conversations and actually 
take some action off the back of it. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think that's a really, really, really good point. Um, so, was there another point you wanted to add there? Or? Um, no, I mean, I completely agree. Like, it, it, it must come from, you know, from the senior management. Um, I think there's, if you look at it, it, it's so easy. Like, you may feel that you're being inclusive. Um, but, for example, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and, and he's part of uh, the task force on on inclusion, diversity and inclusion in, in his company. And he was just giving me some examples that you might, like, you might not even think about. But let's, you know, like, for example, the company gives um, the Christmas week off. Um, it causes its activity. Everyone goes on holiday. But what what happens if you don't celebrate Christmas? Like, what, what, happen, what would you? What if you prefer to take, you know, Eid week uh, off? Uh, so there's very very little things that I think we overlook. Um, and it's very easy to to overlook, um, and and we don't even give like a second thought. Um, mm. So I think definitely. Uh, a big point of focus for for the senior management and and the company leaders uh, to focus in um yeah yeah that's a great point yeah i mean i've, I've genuinely in all my time in recruitment you know rightly or wrongly i well i think it's wrongly um i've never known a business that you know sort of would shift a, a religious celebration week to another part of the year for that person's religion obviously as a as a country historically you know predominantly christian i guess we have christmas and it's that's yeah. that's, that's what we do but actually yeah you're totally right why mm-hmm. should that be why should that be the you know the, the thing of somebody who's of a different faith or a different religion so yeah it's a very very good point yeah that's or even like if you go to the pub you know like some people might might not drink uh and it's very it's a very habit especially in the uk from my experience you like friday like just leave work but then tweet out here and hit the pub um and and someone might might not drink so like all those social things that you do in a company like it's something that it comes just very natural to us um and i think i guess like it's unconscious bias that we're suffering um but yeah but but, but play a, a huge part in, in the inclusion yeah absolutely absolutely yeah some really interesting perspectives shared them around and, and yeah got my thoughts turning you know it's kind of a leader of a business it definitely uh, it really helps to have these kind of conversations and um you know get some of your own sort of uh, thought processes challenged as well so um so yeah i guess you know not a lot more remains for me but to thank you very much for your time and i'll put you put you on the spot a little bit here but i always like to sort of uh, end every episode with asking if you have a favorite piece of advice or you know any, any kind of uh key life lesson uh it doesn't have to be of a technical nature just anything really that you would kind of pass on to your your fellow uh human um anything that springs to mind um i guess i'd say i'm trying to like not be cliche about this but i'd (laughs) say (laughs) i'd say i think each day you know my main motivation at this point in my in my career and at this age is, is to learn as much as i can um and I think um, for those who have like similar ambitions, um, my advice would be to each day do something that uh, is a bit out of your comfort zone. Like today I'm doing this podcast. It's the first podcast that I've ever done in my life. Uh, was obviously a bit nervous, but you know, like stepping, constantly stepping and um, on a weekly, daily basis uh, out of your comfort zone, I think um, will just make it bigger uh, and, and, and allow you to grow and to develop in not, not just as a professional, but as a person as well. So at risk of being cliche, uh, stepping out of your, of your comfort zone, like on a very regular basis would be my advice. Do you know what? It, it might be a cliche. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like a cliche to me. I think it's a genuinely great, great piece of advice. And I'm massively buying into that personally as well. You know, it's the whole hermit crab analogy, isn't it? Like how does a, yeah, the only point a crab knows when it's time to to move house is when the, the shell gets uncomfortable, you know, and that's that's yeah. that's the indication actually of of physically growth, you know, is when things are a bit uncomfortable and you're putting, pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. Every time you're doing that, you're 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 growing. You know, you're pushing the boundaries of your own growth as a, as a person. So it's uh, in many ways, it's reframing that as a positive signal, isn't it? That what you're doing is uh is a good thing even though at the time it might not feel like it actually looking back in retrospect it's always a positive experience if you can you can learn something from it so i totally agree with that love it 
Great piece of advice. Well, thank you again. And I'm glad we finally got there and um, to, so uh, to get our episode booked in. It was definitely worth the wait. Um, so yeah, thank, <laughs> thank, thank, you. thank you again. And um, yeah, look forward to, uh, to catching up with you in the not too distant future, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Guy. It's no worries. Take care. Bye for now. <laughs>